Uh, right, good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to this session. This is track four, session four, so it's all about personalised learning. Um, uh, my name is Matt Brewer. I'm a training manager at a place called Placing Platform Limited, which I can guarantee nobody has heard of. Um, so uh, just you can look us up online. That's absolutely fine. Um, i just got to announce we, we have got a, a slight change to the advertised program uh, in that, unfortunately, David Blackburn was uh, basically taken ill and couldn't actually attend the, the session today. Uh, but for such circumstances, we do have you know, criteria and uh, fallbacks in place. Uh, so the criteria being that we need to replace him with an internationally renowned speaker. Um, secondly, uh, they've got to be able to speak about personalised learning. And in this case, thirdly, they also have to be called David. Uh, so um, we do have uh, David Kelly, uh, who's CEO of the Learning Guild, who's going to be putting personalised learning into context, um, giving you the general background behind it and how it does work. Uh, and also we have, uh, we have Nicola McNeely um, from AstraZeneca. Um, in her 20 years at AstraZeneca as a global, senior global IT business partner, I knew I was going to remember that eventually, um, has uh, basically seen how personalised learning has, has changed and affected the way that AstraZeneca does work and how they've also now moved into adaptive learning. So she's going to talk about how that has worked for them. Uh, so that probably is enough from me because you're not here to listen to me. Uh, and at the end, what we'll do is we'll run both sessions and then we'll do a Q&A at the very end of it. Okay, so I will hand you over to David. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? Am I on? I'm on. Good. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm pleased to be here with you today. Uh, I was, when Don Taylor contacted me Tuesday and, and said that David was going to be able to, unable to attend, would I be willing to fill in? Uh, I was honored. Uh, and then, I then now I'm realizing and thinking, well, did you just not want to have to reprint the materials and, and just say that David is still speaking? Uh, so I'm, a little, I'm feeling a little slighted about that. And then I was on LinkedIn last night. How many of you were in the session that I participated in yesterday around emerging technologies? Yeah. So I was following some of the, the tagging that was on LinkedIn. I saw a post, because I talked about personalized learning briefly in that, and I saw a post that, that was sharing, someone sharing the highlights, and he said, personalized learning doesn't exist, David Kelly. And I thought, well, that's unfortunate. Uh, but it was, it was not without complete context. Um, and, and part of what I, if you were in that session, part of the reason that I, that I made that statement was because in my vision of what we mean when we talk about the term, the definition, personalized learning, uh, there's more promise than what we're currently delivering on. There is a, big, there is a wide spectrum of personalization. And, and I think that the idea of personalizing it to what I'm doing right now in the context of what I'm doing uh, and recognizing all of the different data that is available, there's still more promise to come. And, I, and that's where I want to kind of take you on a journey of, for myself today before we get into an actual case study of someone putting personalization into work. Um, so I wanna, what, what I want to talk to you about today is the context around personalization and to maybe put in a little bit of structure to how you can apply something today. Because one of the challenges that I think we have in our industry is we, we paint something out there of this is what it is. You should be going for this particular thing. And we, we put it out there like that's the only implementation of it. That if you're not doing it in this manner, you're doing it wrong. Uh, and I think that that's an unfortunate mistake that we make in this industry, that I think that what we, all, we all have different environments that we're all working in, we all have different resources that we have available, and we all are, have to find a way to use what we have available to us to get the best possible solution that's there, and what the best possible solution for your organization in your particular environment may be, may look very different from someone else's. And that's kind of the, the, the journey that I want to take you on to, during my time here with you here today. Um, so a couple of disclaimers before we get started. I'm from America, and you're going to see a lot of Z's in this discussion rather than S's. Uh, and I tried to fix that, and every single time I saw that little orange, red line appear under the word, it, it just stopped me in my tracks. I said, I have to fix that. I can't have a red line on my presentation. So you'll see some Z's rather than S's, and I apologize for that. You'll also see the word context a lot um, because it's, this is what it's about. So um, before we get started, uh, if you wanted to learn more about me, you can just scan that QR code. I'll show it up again. If you have any questions after the session, that'll take you to my LinkedIn. We can connect there. You can ask any questions. I love talking about these things. So if you have any questions or anything, by all means, and we'll show that again. But best way to contact me is on, is on LinkedIn. So I mentioned yesterday, I, um, when I did the emerging technology session, I did a session 
Oh, sorry, I wanted to stop my stop at you. Okay. Um, I did a session on emerging trends, and I mentioned personalized learning, and it's in quotes because my session yesterday was around buzzwords. And personalized learning is a buzzword. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit by putting it into context to remove the buzz around what personalized learning is and how, how it's often positioned with in our industry and take it down to the core of what, what are the elements that you can use to look at to build a personalized learning program. I'm going to move out of the way of my slides. Okay, so we're going to talk about it in context, but first we have to look at some context. Before we talk into those little elements there, I think there's, ele there's aspects of the personalized learning discussion with our, in within our industry that we should be looking at. First one, let's look at some history. Personalized learning is not a workplace learning term. It has history within academia. It has history within the history of education in itself. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but classroom traditional learning for children, um, academic, academic institutions, have not really changed radically in the last 100 plus years. Um, the models that we've been using have been the models in place. The one size fits all, one teacher in a place giving one thing for everybody has been in place for, for 100 years plus. Um, and personalized learning came from that area where they were kind of looking at it and saying, rather than having this one size fits all model, what if we were personalizing the experiences towards each individual? What if we could find ways to get it down so that it's the, the, the education that we're providing better matches people as individuals rather than just doing this blanket thing? And, and at the highest level, that's not a bad thing. If we're able to accomplish something like that, that would be a wonderful thing that could improve education. But it's got some history that it's coming from an academic environment, and we're applying that term in the, in the corporate learning space, in the organizational learning space. And I don't think I can understand, that's not just something to just gloss over, because that has baggage, that has weight. I mean, I, 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 there's a whole other session we could be doing on what some of the biggest problems that we have in corporate learning are the fact that everyone has expectations of what learning looks like from school. Um, and, and we have that baggage in terms of people have that expectation of this is what learning looks like. Uh, so there's a lot of context around the history of what we've done, what education has done, and the fact that personalized learning as a term has come from that institution that we just need to be mindful of in the work that we're doing. Next piece, language. Language is really important in this discussion. If I was to say to you, I have an apple in my hand right now, everybody in this room has a shared definition of what that would mean. Everyone would have a, a very similar description of what I have in my hand if I was to say I have an apple in my hand. But if I say I'm launching a personalized learning program, that's probably gonna have different meaning to different people in the room. There's not that shared definition of what exactly that means. It might be in a shared space, but when you get into the weeds of what it means and what I'm doing and how I'm implementing that, it could look different. More importantly, it could look different to the stakeholders that you're dealing with when you say I'm gonna personalize a learning plan. And when you have a situation where you're talking, you're using a term and people don't have a shared definition of what that term means, it's an obstacle and we need to be aware of that obstacle. How many of you are familiar with the ancient philosopher George Carlin? Yeah, so I, I feel I, some of you are, are looking, some of you I'm envious of your youth right now because that's, that's the people who are like, I have no idea who George Carlin is. George Carlin is a famous U.S. comedian and one of his routines that I love, he, he uses the term, he says, we think in language. And so the quality of our thoughts and ideas can only be as good as the quality of our language. And I, th and I think it's a really important aspect, not just for personalized learning, but for just how we talk in general because we use a lot of jargon. And if we're not having a shared definition with the people that we're talking about, then it can, be, it can create obstacles and additional hurdles. And I think it's important to realize that there is no shared definition, there is no standardized definition of what personalized learning means within our industry. I also think it's important to realize preferences. Now, when I put something in quotes, as you saw in my session yesterday, it means that I'm not thrilled with the term. Um, when you see the personalized learning discussion, you will often see that personalized learning works really, really well because it works with each individual's unique preferences. Has anyone ever Googled learning preferences? What do you get? Yeah, you could, see, you could see things about how it's doing it. Anything else that you see when you get Google? Because I did this when I was doing it yesterday, looking for a, a decent image for this and I got about 168 different versions of learning styles. 
Learning preferences is the dark sister of learning styles. It is a very slippery slope. Um, and, and we could have a whole nother session on learning styles, um, but I'm not a fan of the whole learning styles debate that goes on in our industry, because what you hear is learning styles don't exist. And while I understand why people say that, I think it's part of the issue why this debate continues on. When, when people, people, lots of people have preferences to the types of content that they do. I would love an audiobook. I'm a big fan of audiobooks. Doesn't necessarily mean I don't like to read, but I prefer an audiobook because I can do it while I'm wa working and reading. And that is my preference in a certain manner. Um, and, but when people say learning styles don't exist, people can hear that as, no, I prefer an audiobook. Where the learning styles myth exists is that when you take the, the idea of someone's preference and say, if I cater the instruction to that person's preference, it's going to lead to better outcomes. That is the myth, because there is no empirical evidence that shows that, that if I, if I cater instruction to someone's particular preference, it's going to relate, it result in better educational outcomes. The, the evidence suggests that if I match the particular methodology, to the, to the outcomes that I need, that, could, that is going to lead. There is evidence that says if I'm matching the particular methodology to the task at hand so that it matches, it could increase my, my educational outcomes. So the learning styles myth isn't about preferences don't exist. It's about if I try to match an educational methodology to an individual's preference, it would lead to better outcomes. That's where the myth is. But when you're, it's, it's very important to realize that the, the idea of learning preferences is a slippery slope to going down something that is very much a, a myth in our industry around catering to someone's individual learning styles. And th there's a whole other context around artificial intelligence. You mentioned, the person mentioned earlier when you Google it, you see this. Artificial, what we talk about learning personalization today is gonna look very different to how we define learning personalization in the future as more and more tools start to be leveraging artificial intelligence to power personalization, to be able to use the data that's available to us to truly match up to somebody's competency so that we can be matching up, so we can truly be personalizing someone's experience to that whole individual, not just to a certain number of criteria so that we're getting closer to personalization, but really not personalizing it to that whole individual and the environment that they exist in. So, that's just some baseline stuff around the discussion for here today. But what, how can we make personalized learning actionable today? Because just because I might be sitting here saying I don't believe that there's, there's a, tr in, in terms of the way that I would define the true potential of the term personalized learning, I don't think we're 100% there yet, doesn't mean that you have to sit back and say, well, I guess I gotta wait. There are things that we can do to better personalize the experiences for our learners. And when I was thinking about this session in the whole 48 hours that I had to prepare, um, I was thinking about how can we make it more practical? How can we make it more actionable? And I, I was thinking about the buckets that somebody could use to fill around creating a more personalized experience. And I wanna talk about those different criteria because if you look at it, if you metaphorically think of it as a checklist, these are things that you could look at and say, do I have the ability to do this and if you could check it off, you're getting, you're, more, you're getting an increased personalized experience for someone. So whether or not you can check one box on the list or whether you can check multiple boxes on the list, if you're not checking it today and you're able to check a new box, you're, you're, more, you're getting a more personalized experience to the individual, and that's a good thing. So I do believe in, in today's definition of personalized learning, and this is kind of David's soapbox moment. Um, my personal belief is personalization in today's world is not like a lot of the, the tools that we use today where it's kind of an all-in-one tool and you can do everything through that one tool. We tend to look for the easy button on the, on the toolbar in our industry. That doesn't exist today. But there are multiple tools that you can use today, mostly in conjunction with one another, that can create a very different experience than what we currently deliver, a more personalized experience for our learners. So let's look at some of those things. The first one I think you have to look at is the context of technology. Everybody, you, everyone has different tools that are available to them. What is your tool set? What is your t tech stack that you have available in your organization? For some of you, you may have an LMS, you may have an LRS, you may have a content management system, you may have all sorts of different tools that are available to you that you can pull from to create a new experience for someone. For others of you in the room, you may have a situation where you're like, I have Microsoft Office, and that's pretty much all I got. 
Um, and that might be what resources you have available to you. And that's not necessarily right or wrong. That's just the technologies that you have available to you. So you have to look at the tech that you have available to you and say, can I create, do I have the technology necessary to create a particular type of experience that I have envisioning? Think about what the vision is of what you have to do, and do I have the right technology in place to do it? If you do, check the box. If you don't, do you, can you get that technology? If you can, check the box. If you can't, then I may not necessarily have the technology necessary to do it. Keeping in mind, and now this is gonna apply to every criteria that I'm discussing here, just because you can't check a box doesn't mean you can't do it. It just might mean, or you can't deliver a different solution. Uh, it just might mean that it's more difficult or it looks a little different. One of the things that I love, I love doing with my team, um, both today but more importantly when I, was, when I was working as a director of training in different environments, um, was we would go through an exercise that I would refer to as the impossible constraints game, um, which essentially was we would go through a, a, some sort of fictitious, fictitious scenario that we wanted to support within the organization. And then we'd throw an impossible constraint into the mix. We'd say, oh, well, we gotta, we gotta build this training program for the, for the tellers, they have to learn how to cross sell, blah, 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 blah. Like, all right, well, we could do, and we'd throw it up on the wall, and we think, all right, we could do all this stuff. All right, now, what if we had no money? Like, well, we can't do that if we have no money. I think, I understand it, but what if we didn't? What would we do? Like, now I'm telling you, you got no budget. You'd have to buy that, you'd have to buy that, but we got no money. Well, we wouldn't be able to do it. But what if we had to? Someone's in the room saying, you got no money, you got to do it. Or we'd say, all right, we're going to do this. I'm like, all right, that seems, that seems like we could do that, but that's going to take a lot of time. What if we needed to have it live by Monday? Well, there's no way we could do it by Monday. But, what, but we were told, that's the, that's the criteria, we got to do it by Monday. What, do, what would we do? And as soon as you remove, what, what that worked out really, really well with was as soon as you remo remove the blinders that we naturally have on us around what's possible, the impossible suddenly becomes more reasonable to you. You can see solutions that may not have necessarily been apparent. So you might look at it, I, I use the, the extreme example of the only tech available that you have is Microsoft Office. And your default may be, well, I can't do a personalized learning program if all I have is Microsoft Office. And I would challenge you to say, not necessarily. You may not necessarily be able to develop the same type of personalized learning experience that you could if you had other technologies that were available to you, but what could you do if you only had that tool? And if I told you you have to create something that is more personalized than you're doing today, and this is the only tool that you have, and you forced yourself to go through the creative experience of trying to find some solution that's there, you can find solutions that are different. So just because you don't have one of these little check boxes checked doesn't necessarily mean you can't do something. It just means you might need to be more creative about your solution. Next one, resources, as I mentioned. Now resources could be the, te the technologies you have available, but resources is everything. Do you have the time to create the type of solution that you're doing? Do you have the money to do it? Do you have the, ne the, the necessary expertise on your team to execute this? Do you have enough team members with everything else that's going on in your environment? Do you have the resources necessary to do this? Can you check that box? Resources is a huge part of this, and you have to consider that. Do I have enough, enough resources to develop this personalized learning experience that I have envisioned? The environment, you've got to think about the environment that, that this personalized learning program you would create exists in, both from the standpoint of your own environment with everything else that you're juggling, but the environment in which that program is going to be consumed. Depending on what sort of an experience that you're doing, is it going to be adequately experienced for people in the environment in which they exist? The most, the most common example that I used to deal with in the banking is sure, this will work great here in the isolation in this classroom, but you and I both know as soon as we put it out there, the managers are gonna resist because that it's a distraction from the sales team and things of like that, so that was something that very often existed. And you have to consider, just because it's a great program in isolation, is it going to work in the environment in which it's going to be deployed? And if that's a truce, if that's something that you can check the box, great, you've got another box that's, that can be checked within there. If not, then you might need to consider more questions around the environment or more tweaks to the particular program that you're designing. Data. Personalized learning 
is very often leveraging data in some way. A lot of the personalized stuff that we're doing right now is catering to the stuff that, it's recognizing the types of things that people have interests in or, have comp or, or their job roles are connected to in some way. It's leveraging that data about what we know about an individual so that we can match content and experiences to those interests and or related to their job role task or something. There's some sort of relation between the person and their work that we can match up to the content. That's a whole data link that's in there. Do you have access to that data? Can you leverage that data? Does it plug well into your system? There's a whole data discussion that needs to be considered around personalized learning. In order for us to do this for the individuals, do we have access to the data of these individuals, and is it the right data so that we can match up the content to it and the experiences to it? That's a huge discussion, especially if you're dealing with the, if the data is in a sep is not something that you control. If it's if the data is with HR and you have to get permission to do it, you've got to get your IT department involved so you can hook these things up. You have to consider these things because data, especially as we go forward and there's more technology powering these experiences, data is the underpinning thing, and if you don't have the access to do it, a platform that makes it easy for you to do it, that can, that can kind of be something that's on top of it so that you can, that, that it leverages it and kind of does the work for you. Data is an enormous part of it. And then the biggest challenge that you can sometimes ha encounter is this, where, some, where you have to talk to the person who's got the data and they're like, no, it's my data, you can't have my data. Uh, and that exists in a lot of organizations. So do you have access to the data and how will you leverage it? Culture, you gotta ask this question. Does this work within our culture? Personalized learning is a different approach to education. For a lot of organizations, not saying it's good or bad, I'm just saying this, this is the, the, an acknowledgement of organizations, they have a training culture, where if I need to learn something, I go to training and then I learn it and I come back which is different than a lot of cultures where it's like learning is embedded into the work. Learning is a part of, learning is a, is, is a performance support function in our organization. Where is your organization culturally? Because go, if you're not doing personalized learning today and you're going to do something that is more personalized in the future, that's a disruption from the status quo. And in order for people to be embracing the, a change in the status quo, you gotta ask that cultural question. You gotta ask the question of, I'm changing what people expect from this, from, from our department. How are they going to react to it? Because just because I'm sitting at my desk going, this is really cool. This is a great, this is going to increase the learning experience. This is going to make us perform better as an organization. Doesn't necessarily mean the people on the other end of the spectrum are gonna, aren't gonna look at it and say, this is just one more thing I have to do. So what is your culture? Are you selling this? Is, is, are people going to respond to it? Is the leadership of your organization engaged in this and supportive of this so that they're going to sell it to the organization? You have to sell, you have to think about it through a cultural lens and say, what we're introducing, does this match our cultural values? Is it going to be supportive of our values? Are people going to embrace it? Can you check that box? If not, think about, ask some more questions of how can we, how can we overcome those obstacles? How can we get, can we make some changes so that we can check the box? Or if we're not gonna, if we're unable to check a particular box, what can we do to address the hurdles that we would expect? Ask those questions. Next, next, next context, the context of empowerment. I think empowerment's a big part of this here. Do you have the empowerment within your department, within your, within your work as an individual to do something like this? How often are you gonna need to ask permission to do something around this? You know, if, if, you are, if you are empowered, if you've got support of your leadership to go down this path, you're in a much, much better position than if you're going to have to ask every single person along the way for permission. How much empowerment do you have to do something different within your work? That applies to personalization, but it applies to everything. If I want to do something different than what my stakeholders have traditionally expected, am I empowered to do that in my organization? Do they see me as a performance support consultant or a training delivery department? What do they see me as, and am I empowered to make de decisions to move forward? Can I check that box? It's a big one for me, the context of competency. This is, if you were in the session yesterday, um, this, this is where I, I see a bit of a gap between where the conversation around personalized learning is and where the reality of personalized learning is. If I was going to truly if I was going to describe to you a, tr a truly personalized learning experience in my, in my 
vision today. Um, I'm wearing an Apple Watch right now. And this Apple Watch, as soon as I put it, if you're familiar with it, uh, as soon as I put it on and I put in my code, it essentially knows it's, it's me. I've, I've put in my secret code and now it knows that it's, it's me. And my phone can now, because I've, I've put in the security code, my phone will now transmit and anytime I get a notification on my phone, it, it goes to my wrist. And that means that every 15 minutes or so I'm looking at my wrist and people are wondering if I'm bored. Uh, because I got a, some sort of a knock on my wrist. But the real, what a lot of people don't realize about the Apple Watch, as much as it can accept the signal from my phone, it can also broadcast a signal. It can send out a signal that is a verified signal that, I, that David Kelly is, is here. And this is a verified digital signal of David Kelly. What does that mean? It means I could walk up at, a, at an overly simplified level. I could walk up to a car that I own that has now got, that has been paired with my watch, and it might unlock. Or I could walk up to a computer and rather than putting in my password, it could recognize the signal and, and, it, and it can lock, unlock, which is trivial but meaningful. Um, so what does that mean in the context of personalization? So now I'm walking around with this, with this constant signal that is, ver that is a verified signal of David Kelly. I walk up to my computer or whatever device I happen to use. It now not only recognizes that I've logged, I, I, it can log me in, but it's got this verified signal that, okay, this is David Kelly who's about to use this piece of equipment. It goes through the network, it goes to whatever sort of a system I have, HRIS system, whatever, your, whatever system that you have in play that, is, that has the records of David Kelly. He's, a, he's an authorized user of this, this, this equipment. He's certified to use it. We can give it to him. We can allow him to use it. Is he a, what sort of experience does David Kelly have with this? Is he, a, is he a novice user? Is he an intermediate user? Is he an advanced user? Okay, I've got that information. I send it back to the system, and the system will now give me an appropriate layer of support based on my competency in using it. Now, I have admittedly not seen a system that work functions exactly in that manner, yet packaged in that particular way to do that exact experience. Um, but every single individual component of what I just described there exists. It just hasn't necessarily been packaged in, in that sort of an experience, at least in unmasked. Um, so that's kind of where I'm getting, when I talk about the competency level of is the system, is the experience that we're giving someone really matching up with an, to an understanding of how much the person knows, how much skills the person has developed, and are we giving them that layer of support? We can, that's the direction it's going into. In, in, in my opinion, the word learning is almost a distraction from it, which for people who have learning in their business cards, that might sound, not sound ideal. Um, but the reality is, it's about giving people the support that they need so they can do their jobs. Giving them a personalized experience so that they can do their jobs better. Um, and it's about building those competencies. If you want to build their competencies, a good place to start, if we can, is understanding where their competency is today. So I think that's an important part of it. I don't necessarily think, at least in terms of the baseline tools that are out there today, we have that. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I hesitate there when I say baseline tools is because there are, there are tools that are out there today that do a lot of what, I'm, what I've been talking about so far. Um, but there's, it goes back to my earlier point of language. There's what a, what a term means if you looked it up in Webster's Dictionary or whatever dictionary you happen to use, Oxford's Dictionary. Um, and there's what a term means when you heard it be said. Uh, and the best example that I can give of what I mean by that is probably the term e-learning. Um, e-learning, the organization I work for is called the Learning Guild. For 20 years, we were called the e-learning guild. And there's a reason we changed our name for two, two primary reasons. One is because at the time we, the, the organization was created, e-learning was new and different, which for a lot of you in this room, you might be like, well, it's always been around, and again, I envy your youth. Um, but when we first came about, e-learning was new and disruptive uh, because of the, everything was in the classroom. And it was, it was a term that emerged, the e was ele essentially electronic. It was electronic-based learning rather than classroom learning. And that's when the guild came about. We were going to, be expand we were going to explore technology-based education. And over the years, as it became more ubiquitous and more terms of using, most people today, especially non-learning people, if you, get, if you ask them what is e-learning, they would be describing a self-paced course to you. 
They would be describing not this, this wide umbrella of technology-based learning experiences, but a particular product that we develop, that instructional designers often develop around an experience in a course. Um, and that's one of the reasons that we dropped the E, because we, we are exploring technology-based learning and education, and that is a much wider umbrella than what most people associate with the definition of e-learning today. That's where I'm talking about with personalized learning. We, we, if people continuously discuss personalized learning in, in their discussions, that it's this, when the real potential of personalized learning is this, the, the term gets hijacked, and, and, and suddenly, the in practice definition becomes much smaller than its larger potential. And I think this is a piece of it that can easily get lost if we limit personalized learning to the world of recommendations and interests today, which has value as compared to what we've done in the past, but keeping in mind, it still has ways to go, and I think this is a big part of it. And then, of course, there's the context of context. Um, meaning, do I have an understanding of what the person is doing in the moment? Are, are they, what, are the, what is the task that they're doing? This has a lot of overlap if you're familiar with the, word, uh, the, the world of workflow learning or performance support, where someone is trying to do a task in the moment and I have an understanding of what it is that they're doing and I can give them the right support in that moment to help them complete the task. The best example, as I encourage people to Google this, is not a learning example, because this isn't really, this is, this is more of a, of a performance moment here. This is, I'm trying to do something, and I'm, I'm hitting a barrier, or I'm struggling, and giving someone the appropriate support. Google had, we, we talk about micro-learning in our industry, um, and, I've, and I've said many times, I think I said it in the session yesterday, I think micro-learning is a term that, that we've lost the value of because we've been, We've been focusing too much as an industry on the micro of the content rather than the micro of the context. It's not about just taking people, taking the content and bringing it down to smaller bites because our generations and blah, 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 whatever, what a stereotype you want to throw at. It's not about how short the content is. It's about how narrow can you focus the context on. And I think the best example of that is Google did work in the world of marketing around what they called micro moments. And what this, what they did, and again, this is, there's a data-rich discussion here, was, was this was about being able to recognize when someone is in the buying process on the web and being able to recognize when they're sitting on the fence between I'm either going to make a buying decision or I'm going to walk away from that buying decision. Recognizing that moment in time and figuring out what you need to do for that person to, to tip them over to the side of buying a really, really powerful, data-rich discussion that very much represents the, what I'm talking about here in the context of context, being able to recognize what someone is about to do when they, they are performing a task and, and having a data-rich discussion that, re, that can recognize someone is struggling right here. A, it can recognize that moment and then recognize the piece of the support that is needed to help that person succeed rather than fail. At an overly simplified level, 20 plus years ago when I was in banking, we had this in place with our, with our a very rudimentary example of this, with our um, teller system. It was always a, a menu-based system that someone could use. They'd hit A for checking, B for deposits, blah, blah, blah. Um, and we asked them to put in place a system that would recognize every single time someone hit the escape key more than twice before completing a transaction because that meant they were going through the menu, made a mistake in the transaction before they submitted it, and started over. And, what they w and it wasn't a very robust system, but what we asked them to do was be able to track those moments, to, to track the keystrokes, and any time it was menu, 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 escape, any sort of anything where they did more than two keystrokes and then ended with the escape button, show us that, that stream. And then we were able to look at that data just the data of the, they went through these menu items before they'd escape, and find the most common things that people were doing, and recognize this is a task that people are struggling with. They don't know how to do this, what, what, and, and give them appropriate resources. Now, the resources were weeks later back then. It was, we got the data weeks later, we were able to look at it and say, hey, people are struggling with when they need to do a bank check, we need to give them more support and, and more training on this. Nowadays, you could do something similar in real time, and have a system recognize something like that, and give them the appropriate layers. Well, hey, it looks like you're struggling to do this transaction. Do you need support? 
And I think that's an important part of the personalization is recognizing what people are doing and having the system be able to recognize that they're struggling. This is another big one for me, the context of maturity. I don't mean emotional maturity in the individuals in the room. Uh, I mean organizational maturity in this context. Um, there's not, I, it kind of touches on what I mentioned earlier about where you are as an organization and everybody being unique here. It's not about reaching the top rung of the ladder and saying this is, the, whoever's got the best implementation of it and saying this is what you need to do. It's about recognizing where you are on, the, on your own personal ladder, on your organization's ladder, and saying how do I get to the next rung? How do I move up one step on our ladder here? Don't worry about all the other ladders that anyone else is talking about. Worry about your own. And, and I, I would apply this to professional development in, in general, but specifically in the context of per, per, personalized learning. What do I need to do to get to the next rung on the ladder? Don't, don't listen to anybody who's saying, oh, this is what you need to do, who has all of the resources in the world and such. What do I need to do to move me and my organization up one rung on the ladder? And I think that's an important realize. Recognize where you are today and what you want to do to get to the next step, or, or maybe you can go two, three rungs on the ladder, but it's a comparison to where you are today. So with that in mind, I think it would be great for us to see someone who's done this. Rather than me talking about some of these buckets here, I'd love to hear a story. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to hear a story of someone who's actually done this in an organization, warts and all. So I'm going to turn it over to Nicola, and let's hear that story. Thank you, everybody. So, morning everyone. Um, my name's Nicola McNeely. I'm a senior global IT business partner at AstraZeneca. I'm here to talk to you about how we've implemented adaptive learning in order to drive personalization. So, before I start, let me just give you a couple of key points around AstraZeneca. We're a global science-led, patient-focused biopharmaceutical organization who's dedicated to transforming healthcare for both people, society, and our planet. We have over 84,000 employees globally in over 115 countries. We had a total revenue last year of over $44 billion and sold our medicines to 105 million patients in over 130 countries. In addition, during the recent COVID pandemic, the AstraZeneca vaccine reached over 3 billion patients globally. We have um, four main research and development sites, two in the US, one in Sweden, and one not far from here in Cambridge. Um, and you can see from our fifth pillar here that we have a real commitment to people and society. This is where we have a commitment to making AstraZeneca a great place to work and where our learning and development agenda sits. As some of you may have heard if you were at Mark Howell's session yesterday, we've been on a three-year transformation journey at AstraZeneca and this really focused on ensuring we could build a high-performing learning organization that delivered business value. We wanted to focus on embedding a culture of lifelong learning in the organization, building enterprise and personal capabilities to ensure people development. Thirdly, we had a drive to engage and retain our talent through an upskilling and reskilling agenda. We wanted to um, improve our leaders, develop leaders of the future in order to build a diverse talent pipeline. We wanted to really improve the learner experience and future proof our learning technology, not just for today, but for tomorrow. And finally, we wanted to be able to measure the impact of learning and learning interventions on business performance. 
People dynamics are changing, and we feel that connecting the dots between personalised learning and business outcomes is critical. Three key themes um, to discuss are technology is advancing significantly, especially in the world of automation and AI. I think, for me, um, we're going to see even more advancements as we move forward, especially with things like ChatGPT, augmented reality, virtual reality, um, and it's how we bring that to the business in the right way. Learning's changing fast. We know our individuals need to continually upskill in order to stay at the top of their game. We also know that they're really busy. They actually want relevant content at the point of need in order to apply it in their day-to-day -day work. And finally, personalization is simply expected in today's world. We see it everywhere as part of our digital lives. And this normalization of personalization has become an expectation both in the organization and in learning. So, where did we start? I guess for a while we've had personalized learning in our organization, but really focused on more job-specific training um, in the validated learning space, ensuring our individuals are trained to perform regulatory activities. Um, but back in 2020, we introduced a learning experience platform for the first time provided learners with different recommendations that were personal to them based on what their focus areas were for skill development, maybe language preferences, or even a job or role that they wanted to develop into. Fast forward to 2022, and this is where we started to look at our introduction of adaptive learning. Um, through our strategic partner, Realize It. And if you haven't noticed them in the exhibition hall downstairs, they are in bright yellow fluorescent cycling jackets, um, like you can see uh, with Ty in the audience here. So through adaptive learning, uh, adaptive technology, this uses AI and machine learning to really adopt a learning journey, a learner's journey through the content. It's able to determine a level of mastery and determine what they need to know in order to really personalize and take that personalization to the next level. It also has the ability to help support retention techniques through the use of daily assessments and questions to ensure that that mastery can be maintained over a period of time. As you can imagine, whenever you're introducing something new into an organization, you need to make the case for change with the business. So we actually conducted a piece of re research through Deloitte, um, and what this showed us was that in a regulated industry such as AstraZeneca is, we know that being able to demonstrate competence is going to be really important. We don't want it to be just a tick box exercise anymore, where individuals have read and signed a document and can go on to a, a line to say that pack our drugs in the right way, for example. We wanted to be able to demonstrate that level of competence. And we feel that, and the research showed, that actually, through use of adaptive learning and those continual retention techniques, that could help us reduce the forgetting curve. That I'm sure many of you know, as learning professionals, actually 75% of learning is lost if it's not applied within the first six days of learning it. We also wanted to ensure that our um, learning interventions were measurable so that we could demonstrate that business value to the organization. In addition, 
we found that there were a number of adaptive learning features that could help support on our journey um, in order to drive not only personalization, but really look at how we could do things differently. Guided learning, supporting learners in the flow of work. Spaced learning, really looking at how we move away from lengthy training modules to modules broken down into sessions at spaced intervals. Ongoing support for individuals post-attending training interventions. And finally, the AI reinforcement to ensure that level of mastery is maintained over that period of time for individuals. And all of this made adaptive learning and bringing in adaptive technology into AstraZeneca a compelling, leader, uh, a compelling story for our business leaders. However, we also know that learners and managers want to know, well, what's in it for me? So we put together a short video that I'll share with you now um, that tries to tell that story for them. So I guess you're all thinking, what does that really mean in reality? Well, we wanted to pioneer the use of intelligent technology in order to help determine those knowledge gaps and provide recommendations on how best for individuals to build their capability. The challenge we had was most of our learning interventions were built on a one-size-fits-all approach, um, and we had very um, inconsistent ways to help with knowledge retention across the organization. We also have very limited data and insights around competence levels. The focus was really on has somebody completed it or not. So with this in mind and as looking at bringing in adaptive technology, we believe that it could unlock game-changing potential for us going forward. And we looked at that in the key five areas of, we felt it would help turbocharge our upskilling and reskilling agenda within the organization. We felt that it would allow us to accelerate that skill assessment and understand where we are today and where we want to get to in the future. Validating subject mastery and retention, as I mentioned, is really important for our regulatory environment. We believe we would be able to drive efficiencies through those personalized approaches, only having to train on the areas you have a gap in and not having to go through a full training course um, in that one size approach. And then finally, we felt that through the data that would be available, the insights that we could gain, that would help us drive business value for the organization, helping them identify where they could improve in addition to a global level. So over the last six to nine months, 
We've been working with a, norm, a number of early adopters across different, parts of our, across different parts of our business, looking at things from sale training, compliance, onboarding, um, and even leadership development programs in order to look at how Adaptive could demonstrate some of those benefits that we're seeing on the screen. So I'm now going to take you into a deep dive on one of our use cases specifically around compliance. And this is related to our anti-bribery and anti-corruption training. The anti-bribery and anti-corruption training is taken by all employees globally on an annual basis, but the content is only refreshed every two years. On average, it's a 20-minute module using the traditional approach, which equates to over 27,000 hours of training across the organization. We had no way of demonstrating competence of our employees, especially in those areas which had a higher risk around anti-bribery and anti-corruption. We also had no way of reinforcing the training on a regular basis. And again, data, we were only monitoring the completions and not the level of competence. So we looked at this differently. We looked at how could we improve the experience for our learners through a more personalized approach through our adaptive technology. We felt we'd be able to align risk-based scenarios based on where an individual works in the organization or even which country. We could support real-time reinforcement nudges in key areas of risk for the business. We'd have data and insights that could help us moving forward in closing some of those risks down. And finally, we felt that we could really benefit from some of those efficiency savings while improving the employee experience. So, what did our results show us? So, our average time to take the course for individuals went down from 20 minutes to 12 minutes. We were able for the first time to be able to demonstrate a level of mastery across populations, whether they be functions, countries, business units. And we were also able to demonstrate a level of proficiency at an individual level. If you extrapolate out that eight minutes of savings across the organization, it would give us 11,000 training hours that back to the organization that we could use to focus on developing new medicines, manufacturing medicines to ensure they reach our patients faster, which I think is, you'll agree, and certainly from my perspective, is our purpose to make sure we deliver that value to the organization. On the right-hand side of the screen there, you can also see a number of quotes from some of our users who've been through the experience. And I think what we can see from, from those quotes is really them appreciating the time back in their day, appreciating that their journey is personalized to them, and that they have the time to focus on the areas they need to develop on, rather than going through a full training course when they may already know half of it. So, with both the successful pilot for our global compliance organization, <coughs> excuse me, as well as um, our other pilots that we've been running, we're now looking to further scale the use of adaptive learning across the organization in order to deliver our strategic ambition 
of delivering life-changing medicines for patients. But before I close out, I just want to share with you a few key takeaways and learnings that I think are important as you consider your journey. The first, adaptive learning will drive a paradigm shift for your learners and managers. It's really important to grasp that psychological safety is important. It's not about where you start as an employee on your learning journey, but the level of competence that you can demonstrate by the time you get to the end of your personalized journey. Secondly, we needed to change our approach to how we design content in AstraZeneca, both for our learning professionals and for our, with our third content party providers, or third party content providers. What we found is that it's really important from a capability perspective to have deep questioning skills because that's how you're going to be able to demonstrate the competence and mastery of your employees. It's also important to have a content strategy and robust taxonomy in place, because this will help enable drive personalization based on skills um, and based on keywords um, and things that you're, you're looking for. Thirdly, connecting the dots between methodology and business outcomes. Know what it is that you're trying to achieve through the development of that adaptive learning journey and what the measures are that you're going to use to demonstrate the business value. Fourthly, <clears throat> the data that you will get from adaptive learning technologies such as Realize It is significantly increased from what you have today. And therefore, you may find that there are individuals who are doing those roles today, such as your learning professionals, who actually need to upskill themselves in being able to understand and apply those data insights. And finally, we feel adaptive learning really links into our skill-based strategy. We needed to ensure we got our stakeholders in those areas on board and involved in that journey right from the start so they could embed the change within the organization. So I hope you found the session useful. Um, I'm going to hand back to Matt, I think, um, for any questions or reflections, either for myself or David. Thank you. Great. Th thank you, both Nicola and uh, David. Um, we do have some time for a Q&A, so do uh, any of you have some questions that you would like to throw to, uh, to David or to Nicola? Have we got anyone to... Right, I'll get my running shoes on and I'll <laughs> go straight to the back. Thank you very much for your very interesting presentations. I have only one question. Can we uh, personalize learning for face-to-face -face courses? Is that even possible? Thank you. That's a good question. Um, short answer is yes, but it, it's, it, the, question, the deeper question is how. What does that look like? Um, and, and I think that if for, for a lot of, my initial thought is for a lot of that, that's less the course content and more the facilitator doing that. That's, that's, that's less a technology discussion like we've been having here, less a data discussion, and more a skill of a facilitator who knows the people that are in the room and is, and, and is catering to them individ as individuals rather than just doing a sage on the stage thing. Yeah, I think the only thing I would add to that is I think it's easier in a blended approach um, rather than a pure face-to-face -face session. 
Um, the only thing you could look at is maybe breakout sessions with different facilitators for different topics, um, and individuals choose the area of interest or a topic area that you may have pre-assessed before the uh, face-to-face face -face session, uh, and that may help with that personalization. Hi, a question for Nicola. You spoke about, obviously, adaptive learning. Were there any other tools, content creation elements that you utilized in your learning ecosystem to help you drive that, those outcomes? Yeah, so we've got a learning ecosystem of multiple technologies. We have um, Degreed as our learning experience provider. We have um, Xylem as our learning content management system, which is where we manage our content strategy. Um, and our content tagging and meta tagging. So, so those in combination, um, alongside our adaptive technology with Realize It, um, are all fully integrated um, and help drive that personalization. I was interested in your point, David, about the context of the context, because it really reminded me of uh, the jobs to be done framework, which was Clayton. Uh, Christensen and Anthony Ulwick yep. later on, and how personalization really relates to those underlying values. So just to give an example, you buy a power drill to do a job for you, but you need to understand that the job is to have a hole in the wall, mm -hmm. but actually the underlying job is to put up a picture of your family, because that's the underlying value that you want from putting a hole in the wall. So I just wanted your thoughts and reflections on that. How are you getting to those values that the learners want in this personalized experience? Um, I, I might take a different approach than, than what your question is asking, but I think part of it is, is just a, a reminder. The context, the context the context to me is also very important around the idea that learning is about growth. Uh, you know, and, and part of the concern that I have around the personalization discussion, not just within learning, but in general, is if everything that you are encountering is personalized around what we know about you today, and everyone is in a race, and I mean this consumer level, not, not, not learning level, everybody's in a race to get you what you want right now as quickly as possible, then everything is already within our comfort zone that we're getting presented with. Every, everything, that we, everything that we do on the internet is, is being responded to, this is what you're looking for. And what can easily be lost in that is the, but what about what I don't know I want to learn about? What about the stuff that's outside of my comfort zone? There's a really, really good video. It's not perfect, but I really like it. Um, from Eli Paris, or it's a TED talk called The Filter Bubble, which goes into this, um, that, that talks about if everything in the world is personalized, where does growth come from? Um, and I think that's an important element of what you're talking about there, is, is recognizing that we're in the business of growth. And, and how can we get people to see something outside of their comfort zone that isn't helping them be what they want to be today, but is going to help them be something bigger tomorrow? Uh, and, and I think AI is a, an enormous part of that. Just over there. Thank you both uh, so much for your presentations. I have a question for Nicola about uh, one of your groups that you um, tested with, the Leadership Lab. So can you talk us through a little bit about how you um, measured skill acquisition and the business impact on that group, which seems a little bit more difficult than the, than the other one? Thank you. Yeah. So I think, I think for our Leadership Labs use case, what we've really been looking at, so our Leadership Labs are sort of um, coming in at sort of mid-manager level. Um, they are, they've already got some leadership experience or managerial experience, and really it's about um, using the technology in a more blended approach. So we have peer-to-peer, coaching sessions within it. We have um, sessions that are facilitator-led um, and really looking at being able to look at what are the core objectives that we're trying to drive for as part of that leadership journey 
to take them from where they are today um, into um, sort of a, a promotion opportunity or even from a retention perspective. Um, we have 14 global training programs um, to develop our leaders at different levels in the organization. Um, and what we're seeing is actually a 50% increase, not just in the, the leadership lab space, but for across our global programs, a 50% higher retention rate for individuals who go through those than that don't. Um, within our leadership lab's journey, it's fairly new. We've only had a couple of cohorts go through that so far. Um, but the feedback and the experience of our learners um, have really appreciated how they can focus maybe on um, a topic around inclusion and diversity, if that's an area that they have a specific uh, preference in or something maybe that they're not as um, comfortable with. Um, we know at the moment neuroscience is a, a big topic out there in the, um, in the world and in discussions around learning. And that's um, a topic that, again, has been really popular. And people can pick their own learning journey through it. So it's not just about, um, I guess, personalization of the content adapting to you. It's also about you being able to also select how you want to move through that journey. Um, so giving that opportunity to individuals to, um, I guess, to choose how they follow it versus a traditional approach where maybe you're in a five-day classroom scenario where you'd follow a particular path, uh, the same as everybody else. It's given us that ability to, um, to choose, for our learners to choose some of that as well. Does that help? Great. Okay, we may have time for another question. I'll go this way. Um, so I've got a, a drug development background, uh, and I'm struck by the fact that no matter how advanced we get, we still discover quite a few new drugs by accident. Uh, and I wonder if on a learning side, we also learn new things by accident through serendipity. We stumble across something which excites us and moves us into another sphere. Does increased personalization risk removing those opportunities that we wouldn't we would otherwise stumble across through not choosing our own path? It's a really good question. Um, I think, uh, for me, I think there are, there are two levels of personalization. So f the adaptive learning piece that I was talking about is more about being able to demonstrate competence and mastery um, and really adapting content at an individual level. The curiosity around learning and the curiosity of individuals. We have a, a totally democratized learning architecture, learning content. If an individual wants to go and learn about photography um, through one of our content libraries, they have the ability to do that. We don't block any content from people. Um, and they can actually, even if they wanted to, choose that as a personal skill development area. So from an AstraZeneca perspective, I'd say, but I'd also say we're quite high on the experimentation, practicing things, trying out new methods and new methodologies all the time in the learning space as well. So although adaptive learning is what we've talked about today, we've done things such as learning trials, journaling, thinking about moments throughout your day that have been a learning experience that maybe you wouldn't necessarily recognize um, and really trying to get people to think about that in that culture of lifelong learning. I, I would add um, to, to the, just repeating your question, does, does increased personalization create risk? Yes. Um, I would also add that the fact that you ask that question is the most important first step to mitigate that risk because it shows that there is an awareness of it, and that, is, that opened your mind to, okay, so we're gonna do this. The flip side is it could reduce some, some curiosity and it could constrain the, personal, the, the, the opportunity to go beyond the personalized experience. How can we mitigate that? And, and I think that 
that's important to acknowledge. Yeah, the more we go, the more we put these things in place that can that can personalize the experience towards these goals, the more we might be mitigating this. That we might be creating risk around serendipitous learning and, and and curiosity. How can we mitigate that? So it's not a matter of either or. It's a matter of yeah, I can do that, and let's acknowledge that risk because there's risks and rewards to everything. Let's acknowledge the risk. How can we mitigate it? Because that's important to us. Okay. Um, we are right on time, um, so I think that's gone quite well. Uh, so I'd just uh, like to say thank David and Nicola uh, for the session. Hope you all enjoyed that. Uh, so thank you to David and Nicola. Thank you.